This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Two friends were out on a camping trip. Both friends, very intelligent, very brainy people. And they had a wonderful meal at the fire, and it was time to go to bed after many, many conversations. And they went into the tent, and they were in their sleeping bags. When at 3 a.m., one of the friends asked the other friend, friend, what do you see? And as you see on the screen, the friend said, I see galaxies. Hmm, said the friend who asked the question, tell me more. So the friend who's very intelligent said, well, astronomically, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets out there. And astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Theologically, it tells me that God is great and we are small and insignificant. Horologically, it tells me it's about 3 a.m. in the morning. Meteorologically, it tells me that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. And what does it tell you, dear friend? And the friend who posed the question said, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Obviously, the other friend missed the point. Today, we don't want to miss the point of seeing Jesus in the text, seeing Jesus in the text of which God is inviting us into. God is inviting us into a sacred invitation, a sacred invitation. And you may have all of your ideologies today, and I want you to put those at rest. You may have your own doctrines, your own theologies. I want you to put those at rest and let the word of God point you to the truth. Amen? Please turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 2, verse 18 to 22 is our text. Mark chapter 2, verse 18 to 22 is our text. We're in the series of the sacred invitation, sacred invitation. God is inviting us to something more, more of his life, more of his joy, more of his peace, and we are delighted to enter in to his presence with the word of God this morning. If you have found Mark chapter 2 verse 18 to 22, please say Christ likeness. And would you rise with me as I read God's word this morning? Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. Verse 22. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take a seat. Father, we come to you thanking you for your word. Help us, Holy Spirit, not to miss the point today. Help us to see you. Help us to behold your glory. We honor you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many Christians are observing the season of Lent right now, and some of us, even in our congregation, are observing Lent every day. Some of you are going through the Bible reading plan. Some of you are going through a different devotional. Some of you are giving up food or media or giving up meeting with friends and Dunkin' Donuts. Whatever the case may be, it's a wonderful season. Amen. We are leading up to the, the week of Holy Week, where Jesus suffered and died for our sins on the cross. But at the same time, we look forward to the Easter Sunday, the resurrection of our Lord and King. Uh, however, in this season, it's very easy for us as Christians, 
Uh, and I, I'm talking as Christians. Uh, for those who are pre-believers, you're not included in this. Uh, but as Christians, sometimes we get into the habit of stuff like, oh yeah, I'm going to fast uh, chocolate. I'm, I'm going to just uh, fast um, I'm going to fast from media. I'm going to do this. And, and it becomes uh, some sort of uh, a religious act, some sort of uh, rote thing. Oh, it's, it's that season again. Oh, well. Uh, okay, no Netflix for 40 days. Uh, I'll just do it. I'll just suffer for Jesus. You know, and, and it becomes very, very rote, and it becomes sometimes like stale bread. How many of you like to eat stale bread? None of us. None of us. Why? Uh, because uh, stale bread is obviously not good. Uh, but when you think about a relationship, when you think about the loving relationship we have with him and the love that he pours out on us, uh, doing things out of religion, doing things out of religious fervor just won't do. There must be a motivation of what? Love. And in our Bible readings this week, uh, I believe we read 1 Corinthians 13. And, and it's about love, isn't it? It's about God's love. We need to be motivated to fast and to pray by the love of God. We fast and pray for others because God loves them. And where our hearts are so filled with God's love that we're like, yes, Lord, I will fast and pray so that they will be set free in Jesus' name. Amen? I will fast and pray so that they will be healed in Jesus' name. Amen? I fast and pray so that they will be saved in Jesus' name. The motivation must come from love, not from, I want to show off being a good Christian. And obviously, none of us are in that camp. But as a, as a warning, uh, let me give that to you. See, religious piety it can be a very good way to train ourselves from abstaining from certain things and learn uh, moderation. But when religiosity loses its heart posture of love and grace, it can go south very quickly. How many of you know of somebody that, uh, you know, always like, I'm always holier than thou kind of attitude person, <laughs> you know? And, and if you're like, oh, I'm always less, like, well, what can I be doing? And we, as a people of grace, as a people of holiness, we want to be humble. Amen? We want to be servants. And I believe that is what God is calling us to. It wasn't any different in Jesus' time, by the way. See, the people that have come to Jesus today in the text, uh, we read in verse 18. Verse 18 says this, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. See, you need to understand that the Pharisees in those days were people who were very much learned in the law. The law, which is God's word. And, and they were very fervent. And they did things in a way that was, my goodness, uh, if they, the Pharisees, were like a military group, I believe they would be one of the most you know, uh, well-trained groups that you would have ever met. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't want to be on the other side of the team. They were very zealous. They were very passionate about the things of God. Now, in Leviticus 16.29, uh, there are ordinances that the God, God gives for people to fast. Uh, it's just one thing that I want you to know is on the 10th day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work. And this is a lasting ordinance, which includes fasting. But you know what the Pharisees did? In order to make it more difficult for them, because they were trying to earn God's love through their piety and religiosity, they fasted on Mondays and Thursdays every week. Imagine that. Their religious fervor was so great that they actually chose on Mondays and Thursdays to fast. That means not having any food, but only drinking water. And they, they prayed, and I, I believe they were passionate in what they did. They were devout people. They kept the rules sometimes making it harder for anyone who didn't have their eagerness and religious fervor to keep up with them. So, the Pharisees were a people that were really, really hungry for God. We know that. We know that. They wanted to follow the code. Everyone say with me, the code. The code. They felt like if they followed the code and waited for the Messiah, 
they would see the salvation of Israel. Hmm. While Jesus the Messiah is right in front of them. Isn't it like that intellectual friend who spoke about the stars in such poetic and scientific, ideological ways? Maybe for us too. Maybe you're bombarded by ideas and opinions. Oh my goodness, how many opinions are there in this world? Uh, 7.5 billion? Is, is that the population of the world, right? There's probably around 7.5 billion people, approximately. So there's that amount of opinions. But sometimes, can you believe this? One person has even two opinions. So that doubles that, right? To about 15 billion. And so, and that quadruples if people have more ideas and opinions. And we are bombarded by ideas and isms all around us. When you go out of these four walls, you will hear a lot of opinions that are not driven from the truth. It's from themselves. And we all know our hearts can be very, very sinful. And that's what brings me to the title of today's message. Today, God is inviting us to this. Fasting from worldly desires to feast in God. Fasting from worldly desires to feast in God. The Pharisees and John's disciples have come to Jesus and posed the question, why aren't your disciples fasting? Why aren't they doing and living the code as we are living? In other words, they're saying, what's wrong with your guys? Your guys that follow you, Jesus, what's wrong with them? Why are they feasting? How does Jesus respond? Verse 19 and 20. Let's look. Verse 19 and 20. Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. What Jesus does, and I love this about Jesus, he turns their attention immediately towards a wedding. I find it fascinating because I find a little bit of humor in there too. Uh, are you ready for this? See, they're really upset with Jesus right now, and they've come to attack. Why aren't your disciples doing that? And then he turns that question and answers with a wedding. See, even for the Pharisees, when there was a wedding, they would not fast, right? So they obviously knew when Jesus says about the bridegroom, oh yeah, wedding season, yeah, of course we don't fast. It's a feast. It's a time of jubilation. It's a time of celebration. So Jesus turns it around and says, see, when the bridegroom is right there with the guests, I mean, why are the guests going to be fasting? They're going to be feasting, right? And, and so Jesus gives them the truth. Now, all the while, these Pharisees are searching for the Messiah. Do you, can you just picture this in your mind? They're like, we're zealous for God, and I fast twice a week, and I pray, and I give to the poor. I do all of these things. And while Jesus is right there in front of them, they're not getting it. And that could be the case for us too. Because we have feasted on the worldly desires and fasted on God. Do you see that? The title today says, Fasting from Worldly Desires to Feast in God. But many a times, while we're living in this world, it's easy for us to fast on God and to feast with the worldly desires. But today, God is giving us a sacred invitation into, All right, guys. That is not the right way. Let me give you just an example. Uh, how many of you have ever been on a diet before? Okay. Uh, I put that in past tense uh, before. <laughs> uh, I'm not asking any of you if you're on it now. If you are, God bless you. Okay. Uh, see, diets are very 
important things. I mean, if you want to be healthy, if you do cardio, if, you're, if you want your heart to be healthy, like mine and, and Sean, we want our hearts to be healthy. Uh, you know, you need to eat right, less sodium. Uh, is it more, uh, more protein or, or carb? I don't know. Anyways, that's how much I know about diet. Nothing. I don't know anything. But one thing I know, what you consume will turn out to be either good or bad. If I consume bad things, let's say I, I eat potato chips for breakfast, potato chips for lunch, potato chips uh, with ketchup for dinner, whatever, you know, it's not going to be good for me, amen? I'm not saying you do that, uh, but uh, if I eat good stuff, you know, uh, apples and oranges and, and vegetables and, and good things that are wholesome and good for me, uh, and then I will reap good fruit. I mean, isn't it very, very similar to whatever you reap? you will sow? Isn't it very similar to how God wants us to feed off the good things? Eat the good things. Why? There's plenty of good things for us to consume, but it's our choice. It's the matter of the will, and sometimes we are confused and even led by the evil spirits to choose the bad stuff. And then we find ourselves, I don't feel so good. I feel so bloated after having potato chips for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner. Uh, uh, honey, I don't feel so good. I need some indigestion pills. You know, I mean, we, 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 we've been there. And we know it's good to exercise. Amen? But if it's just knowing, I mean, you could memorize all of the movements from all the best like Pilates and yoga movements in all the world, and you could have it memorized. But if you don't do it, will you reap the fruit? Do you see what I'm getting at? We tend to, in our fleshly desires, we want to feast on the worldly desires while fasting on God. And then we find ourselves, I'm so, I'm so stressed all the time. I feel so tired all the time. I just don't have time for God. Jesus is with them. He is the bridegroom king. And exactly what he says is true. They cannot. Jesus' disciples cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them. But Jesus also points out, pointing out prophetically to the time where he will die for the sins of humanity and be raised up again, and then ascend on high and send us the Holy Spirit, he says, there'll be a time when the bridegroom will no longer be with them, and that time they will fast. So, for us who are fasting or observing the season of Lent, what are, you, what are your motivations? Are your motivations out of love for God? God, even if I feel these hunger pains, uh, I, I want to use that to feast myself on your word. Even when I feel like I don't know what to do because I'm always used to having whatever, you know, YouTube or TikTok playing because I, I, I can never, you know, just be silent and be still. But if I let that go, what do I do in place of all the distractions? Do I pick up the word of God and open it up and let it speak to me? What are our motivations? It's quite intriguing how tradition uh, can really turn things sour very, very quickly. I, I heard of a, a monastery, and, and there was a spiritual, um, I, I guess he was the, the head uh, monastery monk, and uh, he would have times of meditation and devotions with his followers. And in the monastery, they had this cat uh, that was really, really rowdy. And uh, during the time of meditation, the cat would be chasing after the mice and row, 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 row. And, the, and the people are like, we can't concentrate, you know? I, I don't know if cats make that noise. I just made it up, okay? Uh, so what the head monk said was, uh, dear disciples, since we're going to have a time of prayer and meditation, can you tie up the cat while we have that time of meditation? So before every set of those meditating times, the disciples had a job of going to catch the cat, tying it up very nicely, and putting it in a corner. 
Now, long time after the head monk passed away and, and all of his disciples passed away, somehow that tradition was still left in that monastery. And people, um, after that rowdy cat died, they actually went to the market and bought another cat. And they would always tie the cat before the time of meditation. How did this even happen? And no one even asked the question. No one posed the question, uh, Sir, why do we have the, the cat tied up in the corner? No one asked the question. It was just a tradition. And, and when they began to get to the root of why this happened, they're like, that was a silly tradition. We didn't need to buy the cat, right? We don't even need to tie up the cat. Sometimes we find ourselves doing things in religiosity, doing things that are just traditionally given to us, and doing it without no meaning. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. Some of you are here on a Sunday morning and tuning into the live stream because of that tradition. What else do you do on a Sunday morning? Go to church. That's what I do. That's what I've done. That's what my mom told me to do. Some of you are here because you just... That's what you've done. Now, God can use that for good. I believe so. God could use everything for his good. But I'm talking about the heart motivation here. Some of you come into this church building with expectation, amen? You come hungry, you come thirsty, you're like you're anticipating God. You're going to move today, and I'm going to listen. I'm going to receive a download from heaven, and I'm here to hear your word. And I, I believe that to be true. But if your heart has grown cold, and on the way here you had like three fights with your wife, and four fights with your kids, and you're like, ah, I just don't know why I'm here. Today, God needs to revive that fire within us, because we are here motivated by God's pure love. The love that would send his only son to die for you and for me. The love that, that gave his all because Jesus had no sin, no guilt, no shame. And the pure son of God, son of man, would die on a rugged tree. Not even a tree like this. This is nicely polished, by the way. Do you know what I see when I, when I reflect on the cross of Jesus Christ? It's not even a tree like this. This is also nice and polished. I see a rugged cross. I see a rugged cross with, with thorns that is not smooth at all. It's not just the nails, but the fact that he was humiliated to be nailed and killed on a tree. Now, no one killed him. They thought they did. Jesus gave up his life. That's the beauty of the sacrifice. And if we understand that he gave up his life for you and for me, then how can our hearts become cold? It's impossible. I heard preachers say this, you know, if you have a fire, you don't need to market the fire. People will just come, right? Right? When you see the love of God displayed on the cross, on Calvary, shedding his blood and all of his water just flooded out from his body so that we may have life, we, we don't need marketing for that. You raise Jesus up, all peoples will come to him. That's what we are here to do. So what Jesus says is true. He is the bridegroom and he's coming again for us. Some of you are waiting for that day so desperately, amen? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord, I see the world in despair. I see the world in fear and anxiety. There is pain and suffering. There is hunger. There is poverty. There is so much in the world that's going on. So, Lord, we need you to come in all your perfection and make all things right in Jesus' name, amen? I mean, doesn't that give you hope? Even when, when my child is crying, can, can a, a parent, a father or a mother, not come close to the child and wipe away their tears? That's what Jesus is going to do for you and for me. Because those tears that we have persevered, 
and shed, Jesus will wipe every tear. He will make all things right. So I love the fact that when other people, like like the Pharisees, and even for some of us, when we miss the point, Jesus brings us back to the main idea, the cross of Jesus Christ. How can we fluctuate in our faith when we hold on to the rugged cross? I'll hold on to the rugged cross. I will hold on to the faith that God has deposited in me through thick and thin. Even if it means I'm going to live the rest of my life not being able to do the things that I did before, that is okay, Lord. You have a plan. You have a purpose. You're going to release me into a new destiny. Amen. That kind of faith, that caliber of faith will raise Jesus up high and all peoples will come to him because we raise Jesus, not people. We're not about popularity. We're not about being flashy and all of these things. We're about lifting Jesus up, making him look good. He's the one who died for you and for me. So we give him praise and give him glory. Jesus gave a simple answer. But we recognize that the people who pose the question are missing the obvious. Jesus himself, the bridegroom king, is with them, right in front of them, speaking to them. And do you think Jesus had like a you know, really stern face when he talked? I mean, for me, in this particular text, I think he was the most composed, gentle, loving, kind posture. And just teaching them, saying, oh, They're there. They're there. We need to pause right now and ask ourselves some questions. Are we, as a people of God, missing the obvious too? What are we missing? Could Jesus be revealing himself to us right now through his word? But we're just too caught up in our doctrines and ideologies and things that we've read or even our experience. Fernanda, you can come in. Fernanda, you can come in. Sit down. Come in. It's okay. Are we caught up in our own ideas, our own isms, when Jesus is right here speaking to us? When Jesus is right here speaking to us? Do you believe that Jesus is the Word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us? Do you believe that he is the Logos, but now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he becomes the Rhema, now Word of God? Do you believe that he can speak into your souls and into your lives and give you hope and a destiny and a future, that he has good plans for you? I believe it with all my heart, you see. Amen? If you believe it, raise your hand and say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We might be missing the whole point. You might be, oh, oh are, we, are we singing the right way? Are we doing this the right way? Did we tie up the cat the right way? I mean, is it three knots or two knots tying up the cat? Just to help me. Maybe we need two cats just to make it more holy. How about we have ten cats tied up? It's not about the cats. Do you get the message? Do you get the message? It's not about your outward appearance looking all holy. Jesus said to the teachers of the law, you whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you look so nice and dandy. I'm paraphrasing. But on the inside, you are rotting away. You've got dead bones inside of you. Hallelujah. Could we be missing out on Jesus himself today? Are we so caught up in our rituals, our religious fervor? And by the way, Oh, can't miss this. Do you know what religious people do really, really well? They are like black belts at judging others. Oh, look at them. Ah, they misstepped. Oh, that, that cat is not tied up in the right way. Because you need a certain type of lace. It has to be holy lace. And uh, it, it's not done the right way. Look at that. Look at them. Look at this. Listen. 
Pharisees are no different to the nowadays evangelicals. I'm telling you this. We have people inside churches fighting against each other saying, you don't do that well. You don't do that enough. You don't give enough. You don't praise enough. You don't preach about, you know, whatever enough. Prophecies in the Bible. I mean, it's just, really? It's not about the cat that's tied up in a corner. I, I just want you to get this into your minds today. It's about Jesus. And in order for us to G see Jesus, what needs to happen is this. We need to fast, which means to empty ourselves from all the worldly desires. Empty ourselves from all of those desires so that we make room to feast on God. And when we feast on God, on His truth, on His word, on His joy, His purity, do you know what happens? We become transformed. We become real people that have real life, that have real stories about the real grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We become winsome people for Jesus. Not those stuck-up people that, that, that go, go around with this proverbial ruler, you know, and judge people. Oh, that church, their steeple's not high enough. That church is not white enough or, or black enough. Come on. I tell you again, it's not about tying up the cat. It's about Jesus. And for us to see Jesus, we need to empty ourselves. Fasting from the worldly desires. The worldly desires have a pull on us. You know that? We need to willfully pull away. Pull the plug. Don't give your worldly desires a life support. Pull the plug. In Romans 6, 23, we, we read Paul writing to the Roman church, church in Rome. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. 1 John 2.16 For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. There are some benefits to fasting. I've experienced it in my own life. If you want to study fasting, you can study Moses who fasted for 40 days. You can study Esther who fasted. You can study the life of Jesus. There are so many people in the Bible who fasted. There are many, many good things to fasting and praying. Fasting and praying can help us disconnect the fleshly desires and connect us to the spiritual source who is God himself. There is mighty power that comes through fasting and praying that can demolish, demolish strongholds, that can bring about freedom for the ones who are in bondage in Jesus' name. Fasting and praying can help us to become humble and weak in the areas that are too strong or too prideful. In other words, fasting and praying can kill off the stubbornness and instill in us a submissive, a surrendered heart. How many of us want that heart this morning? Lord, give us that heart. Not a bullish, not a, not, a, not a way that my thoughts are right. No, God's ways are higher. God's ways are greater. So I submit my thoughts to him. And by the way, if I could figure God out, if you could figure God out, that's not a real God. Because I believe in an infinite God with infinite wisdom, infinite power. There are so many reasons for fasting and praying. But if it's done with a religious spirit to show off, then it's better not to do it at all. I've got to be careful here, though, because some of you who's looking for an excuse not to fast and pray will clap, grab onto that. Search your heart first. It's not about tying up the cat. It's about your heart posture, wanting to Lift up Jesus. And by the way, if you have trained up in spiritual formation, even if the cat's running around, even if you have children running around, that doesn't deter us from worshiping God. We should actually be joyful hearing the voices of children among us. That's new life, by the way. For some of you who are saying, oh, those kids, they make too much and I can't hear the sermon. 
Just listen. I'll talk louder for you. Just bear with me. It's okay. We love them. They're children. They're supposed to make noise. Get rid of that tying up of the dead cat. Not dead. Live cat. <laughs> that just came out of me. We've got to kill the cat. <laughs> Holy Spirit, help me. <laughs> then Jesus goes on to give them some more teaching in verse 21 and 22. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Simply put, Jesus is telling us this. Jesus wants us to not sew the new patch on the old garment. Okay? That means don't put your ideas or your framework of mind, of tradition, right? Tying up the cat tradition, all of those things. Don't put the new things inside that idea. God wants us to bring a new shifting, a new paradigm of worshiping God 24-7. How about you have that Sunday morning experience with God, through God's word, through prayer, through the 555, through fellowship, through evangelism, through missions, that you sense God, you feel God, that he goes with you everywhere you go. You experience that 24-7. How about that? Yes! Ah! We get rid of the, 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 the traditions that just doesn't help us anymore. I'm, I'm not saying we throw away all traditions. I, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of person. I love good traditions, as long as our hearts are in the right place. Amen? Did I tell you about, was it Thelma? Thelma, who used to go to church, she was a faithful saint for 80 years. And in that particular Baptist church, they had a sign. Uh, it, was, it was a Jesus picture. And um, it, it was always lit before the preacher preached. So Thelma would say, there was a guest preacher that week. <laughs> the guest preacher comes, he's excited to preach. And Thelma says, turn on Jesus. Guest preacher's like, amen, sister, yes. Jesus, yes, he's our Lord. And, and Thelma raises her voice just a little, turn on Jesus. And the guest preacher's like, yes, Thelma, I, I love Jesus too. So I, and then the third time with all that she has, turn on Jesus. And then he finally realized he had to turn on that light. See, traditions, if that forbids us from coming closer to Jesus and also coming closer to people, then that needs to be taken away. One of the things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were so upset against Jesus was this, that he ate with sinful people. Jesus didn't walk the code as they thought. Jesus touched lepers Jesus touched unclean people. They thought if Jesus touched unclean people, the uncleanliness would come upon Jesus. But that's not the case. And this is what I love about Jesus. When Jesus touches the unclean people, Jesus' purity comes to them and gives them health, hope, future, and a wholeness and peace that transcends all understanding. That is the power of my God this morning. So, if you think, oh, what am I going to do with this? What? Let Jesus flow through you. Lay hands on the sick and they will get well in Jesus' name. Pray for those that are in bondage and they will be set free in Jesus' name. Oh, pastor, I, I prayed for somebody and it didn't look like the demons left. I'm telling you, if you cast them out in Jesus' name, they will go. They must go. There is no room for them to stay. Amen? Isn't that great? I mean, God has given us the purity to lay hands, not because of our own morality, not because we're so good. It's because of the grace that has been lavished upon us by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Wow. So we walk in that freedom, in that joy, liberty for the captives, sight for the blind, Rising up of the lame, new life in Jesus' name. Hmm. 
God doesn't want us to do a patch-up job this morning. He wants us to actually get rid of all the old cloth, all traditions, old traditions of ideas that church has to be this type of way. A brother asked me this past week, so what kind of songs do you have to sing at church? Does it have to be, you know, hymns? Does it have to be contemporary? Uh, you know, can it be reggae music or country music? And, and I said, yes. I mean, why, why do we have to differentiate all of those things? As long as we have the heart posture to worship God. So don't be surprised next time when the worship band plays a worship song in a reggae style. Worshipping God, worshipping God with the heart of love. Lord, how can we express our love to you? Not in a rote way, but with fresh bread, with the fresh wine and the fresh wineskins to give to you our best. What can we give? So God is inviting us today to fast from the worldly desires and to feast on God, to fast from all worldly desires and to fast on God. This season of Lent, it's all about Jesus. The season of Christmas is all about Jesus. Let me put it this way. Every day is about Jesus. Every moment is about Jesus. And the more we fix our eyes on Jesus, the more we will have the miracles of people like Peter walking on water. Amen? Amen. You're, not, you're not with me right now because you're like, how can people walk on water? It's very simple. You fix your eyes on Jesus and when he tells you to come, you come. Amen? Amen. Don't you want to walk on water? I mean, live in that freedom and the joy of the supernatural? You walk in miracles, signs, and wonders, not because you're any person great or I'm any person. It's because of God. All glory to God. We walk in that freedom of setting people free in Jesus' name, giving them the message of hope. This is what you've been searching for all your life, friend. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He died for me. And when you put your faith in Jesus, he will forgive you and redeem you and restore you and release you into a new destiny. Will you accept it, friend? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let us fast on the worldly desires and feast on God. Father, thank you for the sacred invitation. And Father, I pray that you would forgive us for the many times that we have missed the point. That we have missed worshiping you. That we have been so filled up with our own opinions and thoughts that we gave you no room. But at this time, Father, by the blood of your Son, wash us clean, make us whole, Bring us back to our senses to honor you, to glorify you. And in this season of Lent, O oh God, may we fast from the worldly desires and feast on God. And with that training, with that rigorous training, Lord, may we live holy lives for you and for your purposes. Father, if we have some rituals or the ritual of tying up the cat, as it were. Help us to identify those things today and to say, Lord, I come before you as your son, as your daughter. Have your way in me. Father, there are, there are uh, people in our midst today right now. There are people watching on the live stream right now that need a healing touch from you. And I'm praying in the mighty name of Jesus that you would not only touch their physical ailments, but their emotions, but their spirit being, Lord, would be made whole first. That they would base their faith on you. And from that place of prosperity, of faith in Jesus Christ, the solid foundation, that their emotions would be healed. 
that their bodies would be healed and be made whole. Father, I'm praying for breakthrough today. Father, I'm praying that you would give us revival fire today. Breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Fresh fire, fresh wind. Oh, Lord, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon your people. And may we go out into the mission field, our homes, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and be the beacon of light that you have called us to be. Give us the right motivation today to live for you and for your glory, all because of love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.